Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first of our 2015 town hall programs here at the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. We have to begin by reminding those few of you who have not been here before that the National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And I cannot imagine a more appropriate book and a more appropriate author for fulfilling our inspiring mission and inaugurating our winter town halls than my friend, uh, Chief Judge Robert Katzman. Um, I'm going to introduce him properly in a second. I just want to give you a brief plug for the thrilling events that are on the horizon on February, where our new mailer has just been produced. And on February 12th, which is Lincoln's birthday, we're launching an exciting initiative to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the 13th Amendment. It's going to be great. It's going to be absolutely incredible. And we're going to have an original copy of the 13th Amendment lent by David Rubenstein, who will be here. And Justice O'Connor is chairing a national advisory board to celebrate the anniversaries of the Civil War Amendments over the next five years. And the head of the National Endowment for the Humanities will be here. And we uh, hope that this will be the beginning of the first gallery in America dedicated to the constitutional legacy of the Civil War. And it's going to be a thrilling event. And then just pick up the flyer and see the incredible stuff that's coming up. Uh, the Magna Carta turns 800 this year, and we have an event on that. Uh, James McPherson, one of the leading Civil War historians, will be here on March 16th. A phenomenal debate with our friends at Intelligence Squared in New York City. And the first of a series of debates that we are co-hosting with the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, the two leading liberal and conservative lawyers groups in America. Never before have they spoken to each other, let alone co-hosted <laughs> debates. But now, in collaboration with the National Constitution Center, we will be inaugurating a nationwide series of debates, just like the Lincoln-Douglas debates in the 19th century, where the leading conservative and liberal scholars in the country will debate the constitutional issues of the day. So it's going to be a great spring and a great year here at the National Constitution Center. Um, Bob Katzman, as the extraordinary blurb is on the back of his phenomenal book suggests, is the first and only political scientist appointed to the federal bench, as Thomas Mann of the Brookings Institution reminds us. And that gives this book the extraordinary distinction of actually uh, telling us how Congress works and how Congress people who pass laws expect their laws to be interpreted and how the agencies that apply these laws in fact uh, interpret them. And what Judge Katzman does is identify an extraordinary disconnect between the way some judges embracing what he calls a textualist approach to the Constitution uh, in fact interpret federal laws and he defends very passionately <laughs> Uh, a very different approach, which he calls the purposive approach, which says that it's not only appropriate but uh, necessary for judges to look at all sorts of evidence of what Congress intended, including legislative history. This is a very important book because, as those of, some of you who are lawyers know, um, there's a, a very lively debate on the Supreme Court and around the country about whether or not it's appropriate for judges to consult what's called legislative history and committee reports. And the leading opponent of this uh, approach and the leading defender of textualism is Justice Antonin Scalia, who's done a lot to transform the debate about how to interpret laws by defending this textualist approach. And Judge Katzman, uh, through this book, is now the leading um, defender of a, of a different approach, the purposive approach. And what I think makes this book so important is that it, this is not the book of a, only a scholar, although Judge Katzman was a very distinguished scholar before joining the bench. But it's also of a political scientist who actually collects empirical evidence about what committee staff do, what Congress people do, what um, our lawmakers expect. And among the many, I don't want to step on the punchline and we're going to start the conversation right away, but among the many uh, surprising and important revelations in this book is that Congress people and their staff expect committee reports to be consulted, write the reports uh, with the understanding that judges will look at them. And, in, and th that explicit intention is being thwarted uh, when judges refuse to do so. So with that um, uh, introduction, let's jump right in. And Bob, let me just ask you how you decided to, to 
to write this book. You, you studied this topic as a scholar. You've been on the court. What made you decide to take up this important subject? Well, th thanks, thanks, Jeff. It's it's uh, it's just great to be here. And for anyone who wants to understand the Constitution and the way this country and the rule of law works, this is the place to go. So it's 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 great to be here. And I. Uh, see a lot of friends from the Third Circuit, uh, <laughs> friends from the, uh, uh, sec my Second Circuit days, uh, personal friends, so it's just wonderful to, to, to be here. Um, what got me into this uh, topic is that um, I had, for many years, been interested, as you know, uh, in the relationship between the branches of government, and that long uh, predated my, my uh, service on the court. And um, when I got to the court for some 15 years now, I've been interpreting uh, statutes. Uh, much of what uh, judges do is to interpret the laws of, of Congress. The Supreme Court, some two-thirds of what the Supreme Court does involves interpreting statutes. And um, so I thought it was time having study this, these issues before I was on the court, and then being on the court, I thought it was time to uh, revisit those uh, understandings that I had. And um, I'd been asked to uh, give the Madison Lecture at, uh, at NYU, and, uh, and I was on the subject of statutes. And I expanded that lecture into this, into this book. And my hope was to write something that would appeal not just to, to lawyers and legal scholars, but to interested citizens who uh, have a stake in ensuring that uh, the relations between Congress and, and, and the courts be functioning well, that the laws of Congress be interpreted in ways that uh, the legislators would like to have them interpreted. And so, uh, therefore, I thought, what I'd like to do is to write a book that talks about not just how I, as a judge, uh, interpret um, statutes, not just how I look at particular cases, but try to bring some understanding uh, to the subject by, by looking at how Congress uh, works, how the lawmaking process empirically works, and also how agencies, which are the uh, first interpreters, of statutes, the primary interpreter of statutes, how they think the interpretation of statutes should go. And so uh, the, uh, the, the book uh, looks at how Congress works. It looks at uh, uh, how agencies interpret statutes. It looks at the theories of textualism and, and purposivism. Uh, it looks at uh, cases that I've decided um, and how we went about the, the, the task of interpreting a law of Congress when that statute is, especially in those circumstances when the statute is unclear or ambiguous. When the statute is unclear or ambiguous, what do you do if you're a judge? How do you make sense of those, those words? And uh, uh, my view is that the uh, Constitution vests Congress, Article I, that's the first article, I don't think that's insignificant that the first article deals with the legislative branch. That it vests uh, Congress with lawmaking responsibilities. That uh, it largely leaves to the legislative branch the uh, discretion to determine its own procedures, its own lawmaking process. And that my takeaway is that uh, judges should respect that lawmaking process and think about what is it that the members of Congress expect courts to do in interpreting statutes. What do members of Congress, how do they view their work product? And how should judges uh, view that work product? And, and what makes this book so significant and unusual is that you draw on empirical evidence to tell us what Congress expects. And as I mentioned, you find that legislative history, in other words, the committee reports and debates over bills uh, that describe what Congress intended, 
was emphatically viewed by almost all of our respondents in the study by Gluck and Bressman, Republican and Democrats, majority and minority alike, as the most important drafting and interpretive tool apart from text, uh, and that you've, the study found that members often don't read the text of the bill as a whole, but pay more attention to, attention to the legislative uh, history. And you quote Congress people uh, saying that uh, as one who served in Congress for 12 years, this is Senator Grassley, um, uh, he says legislative history is very important to those of us here who want further detailed expression of legislative intent. Tell us more about what legislative history is, how Congress expects it to be used, and how they manifest those intentions. So a bill is introduced. Uh, a bill uh, in the purest form uh, will be sent to, uh, will, will be analyzed by a particular committee. Congress is uh, divided in terms of committees, different kinds of committees, authorizations committees, appropriations committees, oversight committees. Someone wants a bill to be introduced. The bill will be considered typically by a committee. The committee will often hold hearings. Uh, then uh, when the committee votes that bill out of committee for uh, full deliberation, by the chamber, the House, or the Senate. Often accompanying that bill will be something called a committee report. And the committee report is uh, meant to ex explain what the purposes of the bill are, um, to talk about some of the complexities that uh, the language in the statute, the proposed statute, might not uh, on face value fully uh, explain, to give uh, legislators a sense of the bill uh, itself. Because if you've ever looked at a, a statute, especially an amendment, it's almost undecipherable when you look at how it looks. And so you need that context. Context is important to understanding uh, what that proposed uh, bill is. And so that committee report is vitally important not just to the committee members, but also to the larger, to the larger members of, of Congress, the larger body that votes on, this, uh, on, these, uh, on, these, uh, on these bills. And so my plea is really a simple one. Don't disregard, if you're a judge, uh, don't disregard those committee reports. When the language of a statute is unambiguous, when it's very clear, then in a sense we're all textualists because we don't necessarily need to, to go beyond the text. Um, but when the, the language is, 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 is ambiguous, uh, when uh, you have a statute that says, for example, reasonable accommodation shall be made uh, with respect to uh, people who have disabilities, what does reasonable accommodations mean? What, what, does that, what do those words mean? Um, when the uh, language of, of the statute talks about unfair or deceptive practices in or effective, affecting commerce, what 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 do uh, what does what does an, what is an unfair what is an unfair pr uh, or deceptive practice? Um, these are statutory words that have meaning, and the question is how do you understand that meaning? And I would argue that what you need to do is to uh, look at the contextual materials that is these reports, which uh, uh, those in Congress, it's a bipartisan perspective, those in Congress think um, are so important. And I guess my feeling, Jeff, is that if you don't look at those materials, uh, it's a license to judicial activism. Because then, uh, if you have an ambiguous statute, unmoored from context, that's essentially an invitation to me as a judge to sort of pick and choose. Um, I'd rather have some context to help, to help guide me. And if that context is, is provided in, in reliable form in the conference committee report, which is the, the final committee report uh, in, in essence that is worked out when the bill has passed uh, both houses of Congress. There's still differences, and a, com a conference committee comes together to 
uh, work out the differences. I want to know what that conference committee report says because it may, it may help me. S sometimes it won't help me. But um, I am not, as a matter of principle, just going to discard that, that legislative history. Okay, an invitation to judicial activism. That's fighting words, obviously, especially when that charge is directed, and you're quite open here in your critique, against textualists led by Justice Antonin Scalia who make the opposite charge against your camp. Justice Scalia says it's those committee reports that allow judges to roam at their discretion, picking and choosing among uh, texts and sentences that were not approved as Congress as a whole. And Justice Scalia's entire defense of ignoring those committee reports is that it gives judges less discretion and he has a bunch of other arguments for textualism. He says the Constitution only authorizes laws that are passed by both chambers and presented to the president. That's called bicameralism and presentment. And to look at any sources beyond the text that Congress enacted, he says, is activist. He's also uh, worried that legislatures uh, will write laws sloppily if they know that courts uh, can construct external materials. Uh, for a while, uh, Justice Scalia and others basically said that uh, these committee reports are the product of deal making that don't reflect what's actually in, in the laws themselves. But most recently, as you say, the textualists, uh, not only Justice Scalia but other academics, focus on the idea that the Constitution itself has this formal requirement that only the text is enacted and therefore uh, you've got to look at the semantic meaning even if it's contrary to the statute's overall purpose. So I've sum you've summarized those textualist arguments very well. What is your response? to them and why do you think that your alternative is truer to the, what the Constitution requires? I think that um, when you have an ambiguous um, statute, uh, one should, a judge should look at these materials uh, in part because uh, the Constitution vests Congress with lawmaking responsibility and how that process is to work internally in terms of lawmaking except for some uh, requirements that the Constitution spells out. How that's supposed to work is, is largely left to Congress to figure out. And so the question is with respect to the pre-enactment materials, the materials that accompany legislation, uh, should they be listened to or not? And um, we already know empirically uh, that the members think that they should be listened to, Republicans and Democrats. Senator Grassley will make this a point of, of, of contention in, in, in every uh, confirmation, <coughs> Supreme Court confirmation that he, that he, uh, he, he conducts. The legislator, legislators think that they should. The members think that they, they should. Uh, the staffs think that they should. So who are we as judges to say, uh, we're not going to respect how you think you should be doing your work. Uh, we're just going to de decree that we are going to exclude an important part of that process. So I don't feel comfortable uh, doing that. That's not to say that there aren't abuses of that process, that language gets stuck in, reports, um, unobserved um, as closely as or not as uh, viewed as closely as they sh or reviewed as closely as they should be. But by and large there is a check on that process. And the check on that process is this, that if the committee reports don't accurately represent the views of the members of the committee, those who have crafted those, legis those reports, the staff people, will find themselves out of a job because it's very important for the members to accurately represent to their colleagues in the larger Congress who are voting on these bills what it is that, those, what it is that the bill means, what it is that the committee report means, so that there is an internal uh, check in terms of the way that Congress works that gives some sort of uh, reliability to these uh, pre-enactment um, materials. And I think that looking at that uh, these committee reports provides a guide 
Um, the argument that, that somehow um, legislation will be clearer if only we say, uh, as, as, as judges, we will never look at legislative history, and so that will force clarity. Um, there may be a, some truth uh, to that to some extent, but if we look at and ask ourselves, why is legislation ambiguous? Legislation is ambiguous uh, in part because um, the, the problem is difficult that Congress is dealing with, and they define it in general terms, leaving it to agencies to work out, and so it's, it's, it's deliberate uh, ambiguity. Sometimes the legislation is ambiguous because in order to get a, a coalition of people together, uh, it means all things to all people. And so just simply decreeing clarity won't lead to, to uh, clarity. Uh, and, and sometimes it's, uh, the, the language is, is, not, is not precise because um, it's, it's difficult to foresee all problems that might result. Uh, and so ambiguity is, 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 is often a fact of, of, of legislative life. And if there are any materials that can help us understand that, we should, uh, we should, be, uh, uh, we should be paying attention to those materials. One of the many things that's striking about this book is it gives us a sense of how Congress actually operates. You tell us the sheer volume of bills that are passed in the 111th Congress, um, 383 bills enacted with a total of 7,000 pages. Many of these bills are written by professional staff. They're incredibly technical. You give examples of laws which are essentially indecipherable to the uninitiative because they're written in code. The Hobby Protection Act, Section 15 U.S.C. 201 at is amended. Basically, I can't understand any of this by just reading it. And you say that Congress people, too, who are busy, rely on these committee reports to actually decide whether or not to vote for a bill. So Senator Pelosi, for example, took some heat when she said, I'm not sure if anyone read the entire Affordable Care Act. But what you suggest is that members on both sides don't actually read the technical language and do, in fact, read and invest in the committee reports as expressions of what they say that bills mean. They, I think that's right. And also that they get cues from um, uh, interest groups, uh, from, from executive branch staffs about uh, uh, these various bills as well as, as the legislative staffs. Uh, and, and so I think that you're more likely to, um, you're more likely if you're in Congress to, to read the reports than you are the, these bills. And, uh, uh, and you depend on, on your staff people to uh, bring to your attention the complexities and the difficulties. Uh, and uh, it's not a perfect process, but it is a process that, that generally uh, works. You also, you have a chapter on how administrative agencies interpret statutes. And you say it's striking that courts defer to administrative agencies when you're interpreting ambiguous laws. And these agencies view legislative history as essential reading, and in fact, the agency heads would get into trouble if they didn't read the committee reports because they're accountable to Congress and they'd get their funding cut if they didn't do it. And you think it's, as you say, it's odd that given the fact that the judiciary is deferring to these agencies' interpretations, they don't also adopt the interpretive tool that agencies routinely use. Exactly. Um, I, uh, I'd spent many years in my uh, pre-bench days studying agencies and marinating myself in agencies and uh, uh, and what, what struck me always was, was how attuned uh, agency officials and agency heads were to uh, what Congress was doing, and especially the congressional committees of jurisdiction. And uh, it's not surprising, uh, because uh, if you are an agency and you want to make sure your appropriations don't get cut, you're going to listen. You're going to try to find out, well, what does this committee uh, in Congress think about what we're doing. Uh, it's just good political sense to do that. It, just imagine a, a, a circumstance where in a committee report attached to a law, there is a, a, a directive uh, 
to the uh, Secretary of uh, Agriculture to uh, undertake a specific task or study. Uh, could you imagine that the, the secretary or uh, her staff not reading that report? Uh, that would be crazy. It's just in terms of self-interest, it makes no sense. And so um, the fact that, that uh, agencies uh, look at these reports, I think, is, is instructive. Now, they also look at are reports that are post-enactment legislative history. Um, but I don't make the argument that post-enactment legislative history is, is relevant to the interpretive exercise. But certainly, pre-enactment uh, legislative history uh, is. Now, th there are huge stakes in this debate because by adopting one approach rather than another, you argue the courts may actually thwart Congress's intent and substitute their own wishes. Give us some examples of this. I have to say, in re you, you talk about the cases you've decided, and this brought me back to my clerking days on the DC circuit, and you forget how, how complicated these questions are. They're, they're hard technically to parse this language. It really requires some doing. But give, first give a simple example of a court by adopting a textualist approach uh, thwarted the, the clear intent of Congress. Well, that's a, a difficult, uh, that's a difficult question, uh, but uh, uh, let me give you one slightly different where I think that uh, uh, where the statute was, um, I, I, is one of mine, uh, I have to say, where the statute was arguably ambiguous and I think that the, um, the result was not as I would have it. Um, uh, of course, the Supreme Court has the last word, and I follow whatever the Supreme Court uh, does. So, I, 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 great good, respect. Good, good decision. Great respect for that. But uh, I think this this is a this is a, a particularly uh, uh, good example, and that is that um, there is a uh, there is a statute. Uh, I talk about it in, in the book, uh, dealing with um, uh, children with uh, disabilities. And uh, what the statute says is, is, is that uh, uh, attorney's fees uh, will, be, uh, uh, will be given to prevailing parties, to the parents, in, in these cases where the parents are uh, trying to get special ed or kind, some kinds of services for their, their uh, their children, they go through these administrative uh, processes, and uh, if they prevail in these administrative processes, they get uh, uh, attorney's fees, uh, reimbursement. Um, so in the context of, of this case, uh, the case that was before us, the parents, in, um, through their lawyers, uh, employed also um, experts experts on the problems of these, these, these kids. And that was part of, really, the, the legal case. But these were not uh, lawyers. These were uh, not attorneys uh, uh, doing the, this work. And the question was whether the fees of these uh, experts should be uh, viewed as, 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 as the, the costs reasonable costs under the, uh, attorney, uh, under the attorney's uh, fee provision. And um, what we did was, uh, you know, if you looked at it very literally, you would say, uh, and this is answers your question, and, and it's, it's, if you look at it as, if you look at it literally, you come out um, one way. If you look at it as ambiguous, you might come out another way. So, um, Ultimately, what the Supreme Court said was that uh, in this case, uh, the uh, statute only talks about uh, attorney's fees. It doesn't talk about uh, expert uh, fees. Uh, there's no ambiguity. And so uh, the parents lose. Um, when I looked at the statute and my panel uh, looked at the, uh, this, the statute, 
I stepped back and I was thinking, well, what is it that this statutory scheme is trying to do? What this statutory scheme is trying to do is to make it possible for uh, parents who have these uh, kids with disabilities and these kids themselves to pursue their case. That's why there's a provision for uh, reasonable uh, uh, attorney's fees. So um, we thought it would be sensible to look at the, the legislative history. And we looked at the uh, conference committee report. The conference committee report clearly says, unambiguously says, this is the, 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 the final language voted by the Congress, clearly says that expert fees uh, shall be included as, uh, as, as reasonable costs. Um, but um, because our view was uh, our view was not accepted. Um, we, we, uh, uh, our view was uh, rejected by, by the court. Now, um, Justice Breyer, in a, uh, in a wonderful, uh, unfortunately, it was a dissent, uh, <laughs> said, uh, said, said, what the court has done in this case has been to divorce law from life. Divorce law from life. And he, of course, Justice Breyer, had been uh, chief counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee. So he understands the way that process uh, works. So I, I think that's uh, an example where um, uh, someone's literal, literalism can, uh, can lead to a result that I think is not what Congress uh, had, had, had in mind. And uh, uh, it's... Uh, uh, I think I think I think it's I think it's a, I think it's a good example. It's a very powerful example. You do quote Justice Breyer's eloquent dissent, which also says that only by reading language in light of its purpose can we maintain the democratic link between voters, legislators, statutes, and ultimate implementation upon which the legitimacy of our system rests. By contrast, the majority opinion, written by Chief Justice Roberts, uh, it was a six to three decision, says. Putting the legislative history aside, we see no support for respondents' position under these circumstances, where everything yeah, other a, than... I think it was Alito. Oh, forgive me. Uh, Justice Alito um, uh, <laughs> says that uh, under these circumstances, where everything other than the legislative history overwhelmingly suggests that expert fees may be recovered, the legislative history is simply not enough because of the unambiguous text. Does this come down to the question of deciding whether or not a text is unambiguous, and do you believe in situations like this that the text is ever unambiguous? I mean, you give some examples where it says you have to have this much drugs, and if you have fewer drugs, then it's unambiguous. But short of that, isn't the game over once the court decides that the text is unambiguous? It's a great question. Uh, as I, I agree that there are circumstances where the text is, 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 is uh, unambiguous. But there are other examples where the text is seemingly unambiguous, but when you think about it in terms of the context of what it is that Congress had in mind, what it was trying to do, then there's, uh, you're not quite sure um, about that text, and further investigation is, is useful. Uh, I say, for, for instance, that you can have a, a statute that seems to be absurd on its uh, face, and you may look at the legislative history, and the legislative history confirms, well, yeah, that's what Congress had in mind. It's not my place in that circumstance to substitute my judgment for what I think is an absurd result. We honor what it is that Congress had in mind. And so the whole idea of looking at uh, legislative uh, history is to uh, honor what Congress had in mind to constrain the judicial role not to enlarge it. Empirically, you've been a scholar and you've been a judge. You do believe, do you believe that when the court uh, imposes a textualist interpretation, it's more likely to thwart Congress's intent than to serve it? It depends on the it depends on the statute because where the statute is is um, is is airtight and uh, in the context in which it was enacted, 
purposes are, are clear, where the statute is, 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 the text is clear, then that doesn't thwart the will of Congress. Um, but where uh, it just, reading it, there seems to be something that doesn't make sense to you as, 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 as a reader. Uh, trying to think about what it is that Congress had in mind, then it can thwart it. So um, there are many cases where we're all textualists, but then there are other cases where, where we're not. And so I, I, uh, uh, I, I, I think we need to use all the tools in the toolbox, uh, st the, the statute, the text, uh, statutory structure, the history, uh, dictionaries, uh, where they're useful, um, all those things, and see how the tools in the toolbox can help us. Now, I guess the textualist would say even if the textualist approach does thwart Congress's intent, that's fine because it's the text that's enacted, not the purpose. We've got a big case coming up. I'm not asking you to comment on the substance, but uh, rather on the stakes. The Supreme Court this year is going to decide whether the Affordable Care Act that agreed that it creates exchanges uh, at the, that are created by the federal government, not by the states, should those exchanges get tax subsidies. And the textualist challengers say the law clearly says that only state-created exchanges get the subsidies. And the counter-argument is both the legislative history clearly intended federal subsidies and also there's a textualist argument that if you look at the thing as a whole, the federal subsidy should be covered. As a purposivist, um, w what do you say to the textualists who say, well, even if Congress's intent is thwarted, too bad, this is what they wrote, and we've just got to enforce the text and let the heavens fall? Without, uh, without talking about this specific case. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> and, I'm, possibly I'm, uh, <laughs> and Jeff, I'm really looking forward to uh, reading your commentary. As this is. <laughs> Absolutely. I've, I've already read some of it on this and I did some of the interviews you've done. and, and uh, so you could answer the question better than I could, Not but, but uh, I think that uh, uh, especially where you have major pieces of legislation, uh, and, and as judges, we should be thinking about uh, what, is, what did Congress uh, have in mind, especially, because especially when you're dealing with major pieces of legislation where there are uh, important stakes our antenna should be raised as to how we uh, interpret those statutes and uh, proceed with humility about what we know and what we don't know. That call for humility pervades this great book and you say at the very beginning that really uh, the Constitution, far from requiring this textualist approach, requires the opposite because that is what allows the people to enact their will into law through their representatives. Uh, you say that uh, Congress and the courts are engaged in an ongoing venture. The better understood the legislature makes its laws, the more likely the judiciary will interpret those ways consonant with congressional meaning. I guess I'm inviting you to, to make the very strong positive case for why the Constitution requires this purpose of inter inquiry. I think that there is a uh, the Constitution that it, in a sense, provides for uh, this role for the Congress's will to be known, uh, and for the courts to try to honor the congressional will, uh, and so. Um, Congress is, 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 is a collection of all these people and all these committees. It's complicated. It's messy. And uh, the role of a judge is to in, interpret the statute in a way that um, reflects uh, what uh, Congress had in mind. And I believe that that's, constitutional, that's what the constitutional founders had in view. There is a reason why they didn't have detailed procedures in, in, the, in the Constitution. They left it to the Congress to figure out how that lawmaking process would work. And 
that was, I think, based on their experience from uh, uh, in the early days before the Constitutional Convention, the Articles of Confederation. This view that, that um, what we should do is to give institutions of government flexibility in terms of developing their processes and, and procedures. Gouverneur Morris has that wonderful language where he says uh, that uh, uh, what we did is imperfect. We've left for future generations to perfect what it is that we did. And so uh, that has to mean, it seems to me, with respect to the courts and the Congress, that the role of, of, of the court is to um, reflect as best it could, can what, what Congress um, had in mind. Your, one of your old uh, bosses, Abner Mikva, had, had that line several years ago that when the courts become part of uh, interpreting statutes, they become as much a part of the legislative process as any other part of that process. I'm not sure I necessarily go that far, but I would say that that's a caution. If you're going to be involved as a court in interpreting the laws of Congress, and if uh, the Congress's will is to, is to be what uh, is, uh, is, it, is, it, is it here to, then you really, as a judge, should, 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 should move very carefully and that um, understanding the purposes are, 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 critically, are critically important. Because if, uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't try to figure out what it is that Congress had in mind, you're going to wind up, I think, substituting as a judge uh, your own judgment too often for, for the legislative uh, uh, purpose. Which is exactly what the text will say they want to avoid. It was a great honor to work for Judge Mikva. He was, I think, one of the last judges to have served in all three branches. He was a congressperson, a chief judge of the D.C. Circuit and White House Counsel. You note in this book, it used to be that many more judges served in Congress and vice versa, and now there are very few. I think two judicial exactly. Congress people and only one or so, one, one yeah. a congressperson on the courts. Um, is that a bad thing? Should there be more cross uh, uh, pollination? I think it's. I think it's too bad. Uh, when I uh, first got into this as a uh, very young person, I was working on the uh, committee on the judicial branch, which is one of the committees of the judicial conference, which years later I would chair. And the chair of that committee was Frank Coffin, who got me really into a lot of this work. Um, and on that committee. There were, I mean, there was there was Abner Mikva, uh, the Hungate was on that on that committee. Tom Meskel, uh, Don Russell, Orrin Harris, all these people, uh, Charles Wiggins. There were all these people who had vast uh, legislative uh, experience, and uh, uh, it's it's and it's it's and it's, it's, so it's too bad that we don't have more of that. Um, and similarly, in the, in the Congress, although we have a number of legislators uh, who were clerks and we have staffs who were staff members who had um, served as, as clerks, um, I think we need more cross-pollination because more cross-pollination leads to greater understanding of each, of each branch's uh, workways. We have phenomenally smart uh, questions, unsurprisingly, from our great audience of Third Circuit judges, clerks, and our great NCC members. But I have just uh, two more questions that I want to ask before turning to these excellent ones. I loved your citation of Governor Morris and the founders. After the show, I hope you and all of our guests will accompany me uh, after the book signing and the book purchasing down to <laughs> Signers Hall to see statues of Gov Governor Morris and James Madison, and then to our new gallery, which just opened on Bill of Rights Day, displaying one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights, which is a complete thrill. But you quote James Madison uh, on the following behalf. He says, it will be of little avail to the people that the laws are made by men of their own choice if the laws be so voluminous that they cannot be read or so incoherent that they cannot be understood. Um, uh, so my question is, 
have we strayed from Madison's hope that the people would be able to understand the laws that were written? And, and more broadly, are you, after studying the way Congress really works, more or less optimistic about the functioning of the legislative branch? I, I think that, uh, uh, yes, there is a problem of, of too often of, of not being able to, to make sense of, of the words. Um, and we also have the increasing challenge of these large, uh, as you know, omnibus bills, where these bills are uh, patched together into these uh, large measures that are passed at, at the end of a Congress, typically, uh, right before Congress uh, uh, adjourns. And uh, there is always a danger in those kinds of bills that you don't have the kind of uh, deliberation and the kind of accompanying materials that will be helpful in understanding uh, the process. Um, so that is, that is a problem. Um, but at the same time, uh, I'm really quite optimistic uh, because I think that we have an incredible, uh, we have an incredible governmental structure. And I think that um, We've got people in government who are trying uh, to do the right thing according to their own uh, values and purposes, whether we agree with them or not. If, if, if you are dealing with people in the elected branches, that's not my, my purview at this time. Um, but I think that um, uh, if I didn't, if I, if, I, if I were pessimistic and thought that we couldn't do better, then I wouldn't be writing this book. And I actually think that uh, we can work together to make things better. I got that sense. And although it's fashionable to bash Congress and its approval ratings are low, I had the sense that you believe, and you give empirical reasons for our believing, that both members of both parties are eager to work constructively with the judiciary and with each other on behalf of common purposes. And you have, in this great last chapter, a series of practical proposals for improving that collaboration. You described the work you did at the Governance Institute at Brookings, where you were, I, I jumped in without introducing you properly because I was so eager to get study, uh, started, but uh, Chief Judge Catchman was uh, a, a fellow at the Governmental Studies Program at Brookings, president of the Governance Institute, Walsh Professor of Government and Professor of Public Policy at Georgetown. Um, and the Governance Institute, uh, you say, came up with this great idea that was supported by members of both parties of simply transmitting to Congress lower court opinions that had statutory rulings so that Congress could respond. Tell us about other things that have been done in the past and you think could be done in the future to increase that collaboration. And tell me also how the NCC can be a part of this, because I think we can usefully uh, play a role in convening Congress people and judges on behalf of these common purposes. That would be great. And we should talk about that uh, later. We will. Uh, <laughs> I think that, yes, there, there are a number of measures, uh, and uh, not, not uh, earth-shattering measures, but measures that can improve understanding. Uh, there's the project that you mentioned, which uh, Justice Ginsburg has, has termed uh, statutory housekeeping, uh, whereby we, we have these opinions uh, that um, interpreting statutes of the courts of appeals. and where there are ambiguities or where there are uh, uh, perceived technical problems, uh, there is a process whereby those opinions get sent without comment to the legislative branch. It goes to the drafting offices of uh, the, the Senate and the House. They look at the opinions. They identify the issue. They take it to the committees. And uh, the committees can decide whether to do anything or not. Um, Oftentimes, they don't because basically they're satisfied with the interpretation that the, the courts uh, came up with. But that's a device where, which I think is very useful. Russell Wheeler of the Governance Institute is overseeing this now uh, because it's a mechanism that the leaders of Congress like. Um, and so we're doing something that uh, is responsive to the legislature. Uh, it's a neutral mechanism of, of communication. 
It involves no cost. It's always important. Yes. And, and, uh, and, and, and I think that it, it promotes better understanding. The drafting offices love this project because they will then take these opinions to uh, their own drafters and say, you see, here are the problems that courts have to deal with. Um, so it's, it's, that's a useful project. Um, other projects that I think are useful are, for example, uh, the Federal uh, Judicial Center uh, in Washington could have uh, programs uh, for legislative staffers. The Judicial Center is part of the judiciary. You have programs for uh, uh, legislative staffers and members uh, about the judiciary. About the judiciary. Um, similarly, the Library of Congress uh, could have programs for the uh, judiciary. And the, the NCC would be great for, for all this too. Could have programs for the judiciary on issues having to do with uh, the lawmaking process. How does Congress actually work? Um, how does the drafting process actually work? There is a, uh, a nice little pamphlet by uh, Doug Bellis um, of the uh, drafting office of the, of the House that outlines some of this. So I think that could be useful. Um, then um, there are other time-worn uh, proposals that still merit attention, like checklists. Um, that would be helpful in terms of writing bills. Um, checklist of issues which, if not dealt with, will uh, typically result in, in court tests, like where there's statutes of limitations, uh, uh, private rights of action, and so on and so forth. Um, other thoughts, Steve Charnovitz, your, your colleague, um, at uh, GW had, has, has proposed the idea that the enrolled bill, which is the final bill that actually goes to the president for signature, have a company with it um, some statement of what the authoritative legislative history is. Um, so there are lots of things that, that uh, I think uh, could be done. And uh, I think uh, it, it, it's fun to for all of us to think about how we can work together on them. Great. Well, we'll look forward to continuing that conversation and let us get right into these excellent questions. Should the court give consideration as to how an opinion could damage society, e.g. Citizens United, get gutting the Voting Rights Act and now possibly destroying Obamacare? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not the best person to ask, but fortunately, I have sitting next to me Somebody who can really answer, not only can answer those questions, but has answered them since I have, I have I've read his uh, commentary over the years. So. Nice, nice dodge, but I will, uh, <laughs> I'll refer uh, the questioner to our phenomenal We the People podcast. We, we've done podcasts on each of these questions that present the arguments on both sides. And just, I was thrilled recently, this is a plug for these podcasts, they're now getting 300,000 downloads a week ranked number two among 700,000 news podcasts ranked by Podbeam. So there's a national hunger for this sort of reasoned constitutional debate. It's such a, it's a, such a terrific idea that you've had to do this. I mean, just to, the idea of having reasoned discussion on all sides of an issue is something that we need to have more of. Well, it's much like your approach to judging statutes. You believe that if reasonable people look in good faith at the available materials, they're not always going to agree, but sometimes they may. And we've found the same thing when it comes to constitutional debate. Here's the next question. If Congress is on notice that courts will apply only a textualist approach, wouldn't that suffice to ensure that the, te that, that the text of laws reflect the intent? It's a great question. I, don't, I think the answer is, uh, is no, because I think that uh, ambiguity is a fact of life for the reasons that um, I, I, I mentioned a bit earlier, and that is that um, oftentimes it's not clear exactly how a problem should be dealt with. So the ambiguity is in the text precisely because the thought of Congress is to identify the issue and then let the agency uh, try to make sense of it. Um, and so it, there is deliberate ambiguity. And then there's the ambiguity of politics. Um, Herbert Kaufman, a, 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 an old and good friend of mine, political scientist, uh, once wrote that ambiguity is the solvent of, of disagreement. 
Uh, <laughs> and it's a great line because it's true that you, 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 you get this ambiguity because uh, a piece of legislation can mean all things to all people and that's how you get that, that passed and that's of course then leads to the interpretive problems that, that we've been talking about. You also say that even though in some sense Congress is on notice that some judges apply the so-called canons, which are these formalistic rules about interpretation, lots of Congress people and their staff just don't know about the canons and don't think about them. Exactly. And um, we now have uh, further empirical evidence from uh, the gluck bressman study that shows that a lot of the canons are not canons that uh, anybody in the staff uh, knows about or thinks about. There are some canons that they do know, know about and, um, and I have found some canons to be useful but those are the universally accepted um, canons. Uh, again, Judge Mikva had that line about um, when we were in Congress the only canons we knew about were those that the Pentagon bought and didn't work or didn't shoot straight. Or something yeah. like that. So, and, and Judge Posner has a good line about the canons too, I think. Yes, yeah. I mean, he, he says that the problem with the canons is that they lack a key. That if you look at the canons, which are these broad principles that are supposed to guide uh, action, um, they lack a key as to um, uh, which canon is, uh, should prevail over another one. Um, so, uh, if you have a canon that says that every, every word should be given literal effect, but then you have another canon called the absurdity canon, uh, which allows for the rejection of uh, literal meaning when uh, the language is absurd. Well, those canons are in conflict. And how do you choose? And if the canons lack a key, then it's not, it's not that they're not that uh, useful. Um, so I'm, I understand that canons can be, can be useful, but I, I don't think that they are the, the, the answer. Do committees usually amend ambiguous terms of a bill, and would restricting congressional bills to topic relevance help judicial decisions? The, that's another good question. In other words, uh, I guess in a way the question is, can you change the words of a statute in the com effectively in the committee report uh, by the way that uh, the committee report is, is written? And um, I think that it's not so much changing the words, uh, it, 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 it's not so much changing the words of the statute, but giving context to the words of the statute. And, um, but it is something you know you have to look for. You have to look out for. You want to make sure, if you're a judge, that the committee report language uh, seems to uh, really, uh, in a sense, track what it is that Congress is doing, and it's not simply inserted language that um, seems divorced from the whole statutory scheme and purpose. The next question asks basically how you do that. It's a version of the previous one, but they say, how do we prevent or at least compensate for legislative history deliberately intended to negate the effect of a law that's inevitably going to pass? In other words, how do we encourage the use of legislative history without falling prey to congressional sabotage? I expect that based on human nature, the minority side would always try to sneak a poison pill into the record. Maybe you could give an example of a yeah. case where you concluded that the legislative history was manipulated uh, in a way that didn't reflect congressional intent. Uh, <clears throat> I wrote a book, I wrote a book, uh, uh, Institutional uh, Disability, uh, years ago, and that was about um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act says that no otherwise uh, handicapped, uh, otherwise qualified handicapped individual shall be discriminated against in any program, uh, federal program receiving uh, financial assistance. So that, th that, those are the words of the uh, statute. Um, Congress didn't give much thought to that. It, it gets passed. Um, then a, a couple of years later, um, in a committee report, uh, 
executive branch officials uh, who looked at this statute thought, well, we could have a whole regulatory scheme based on this statute. I think in a well-meaning uh, view of how to implement the statute. And so they put in the committee report language. Um, this was a year, a year later, and this was language in a committee report where the statute itself was not amending Section 504. But what it said in this committee report is that when Congress passed this, uh, pa passed Section 504, it meant for <coughs> the um, uh, Office of Civil Rights to have jurisdiction over the uh, development and implementation of regulations uh, implementing Section 504. And nobody had that in mind when Congress passed it. So uh, that's the kind of thing where you really have to be uh, a diligent. Now, the, the check on it is this. It's not so much that courts, it's not just that courts have to be mindful, because how am I as a judge, unless I actually did a study of Section 504, which I couldn't do, how would I know? <clears throat> the check on it is that, and it's not fail safe, the check on it is that the members, the members are very uh, mindful of, of, of report language that distorts legislative meaning. And the reason for that is that um, they pass the legislation with something in mind. And then if somebody is, is slipping something in, it is a source of, of concern. And the staff people who, 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 who slip that in will find that they'll, their jobs will be uh, imperiled. Um, and the other point also is that if you're a legislator, you want your colleagues to trust you. And so if you're not mindful of these kinds of, of tricks in, in, in report language, you're not going to have that trust because you will have reported to your members what this bill, bill means. So sometimes you could put language in reports that are, we would all say are for a good thing. So someone might say in the example that I just gave, well, that was for a good thing. Um, but it's, it's, others might disagree that it was for a good thing. But the point is that it does happen, and, uh, uh, and I guess I'm saying that even though I know it does happen from time to time, on balance, it's much better, in my view, to try to make sense of these materials than to discard them. This, this next question asks, why should Congress be ambiguous about something like reasonable accommodations? Why not spell out what it means? And that leads to the broader question. There are some cases, as you've said, where Congress just can't agree, and that's why they're being ambiguous. Are those the majority of cases, or do you think in, in the majority of cases, is there a determinant meaning that courts can discern if they just look at the relevant materials? <laughs> I think that in most cases, and I've, I've thought about this quite a bit, in most cases, by looking at the relevant materials, you do get a pretty good sense. Uh, and I really had quite an open mind on this. Um, I was prepared to say that uh, the ambiguities are such that these materials, and, and these materials are such that uh, maybe we can't make sense of them. But um, uh, I think the materials are quite helpful. Um, sometimes they're not. I want to emphasize, sometimes I'm sure my colleagues, my judicial colleagues here would say the same thing. You, you, you look at a statute, you look at the legislative history, so-called legislative history, and you just say, I don't really have a good sense of what was going on here. And you do the best that you can under that circumstance. Uh, but uh, by and large, I find that uh, legislative history uh, looking at the hierarchy of reliable legislative history, especially the conference committee reports and the committee reports, really can give you a very helpful sense. Uh, well, we, uh, I'd love to continue. We should wrap up so we, people can get this great book and sign it. I'm going to ask one last question. The kind of were you surprised question is the most banal one an interviewer can ask, but I'm, I'm genuinely interested. Here you are a political scientist and a scholar studying Congress. You become a judge. Were you surprised by what you describe as the lack of familiarity most judges have about how Congress operates and how they expect laws to be 
interpreted. And do you believe that lack of familiarity comes uh, more from Justice Scalia's contribution to saying that it's bad to look at this stuff? Or is it more that it's just hard work to actually dig through all these reports and judges are not used to doing it? I, I, think, <laughs> I think that most of my colleagues uh, really true, do, I mean, they do, they do try to understand the legislative process. And I think that if you, you did a poll, you'd find that, that most of my colleagues really uh, undertake a, a good faith effort to understand that, that uh, process. Um, but it's always great to have refresher courses and continuing legal education on, on how that process uh, works. And especially if you've not really studied the process or been part of the process, uh, there are so many uh, lac lacuna, so many uh, interesting uh, ways that Congress works that one needs to learn about. You can't just uh, necessarily open a book and figure it out, but there can be uh, ways to educate all of us about uh, more about how, how Congress uh, uh, functions. And uh, um, so it's, uh, we have this ongoing experiment. That's why we have the National uh, Center, Constitution Center, to, to help guide us in, in all these things. And uh, so thank you for having me. Well, thanks for those nice words. Please join me in thanking Chief Judge Kasson. Thank you. Thank you. The book is wonderful.